created using Powtoon. Welcome to How to Make Your School a Digital Rockstar. Today we're talking about e-learning and security. Did yeah, I get it right? Well, security suddenly, and all those sorts of things. Yes. Suddenly I get very insecure now that we're on in the moment. I feel like I don't know now. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, you are Michael. I am Michael. Hello, Helen. How are you today? I'm good, thank you. How are you? Very good. That's good. And we have heard from you before. We know where you come from. So I'm not going to ask you to retell us again. I think you proved yourself in the last two webinars Thank that you, you do know what you're talking about. So if you don't know where he comes from, go and watch the past two webinars and you can see there. Also, it's pretty good content in those last two. I think we've covered a great deal of content, yeah. Yes. So they're worth watching if you're not only watching to find out who Michael is. That's right. Yes. I think there's more important reasons to watch than finding <laughs> yes. out who I am. <laughs> Very definitely. And, of course, we have Dylan behind the buttons, and he'll be watching the Twitter feed. And remember, that's a hashtag VA webinars. That's via Africa webinars. If you want to talk to us, or you can scroll down from this window, and you'll see just below there's a little chat box. You enter in a login name. And Dylan will be watching there as well for any comments and feedback, as well as if you want to make comments on the Via Africa Facebook page, be watching there. Great. Okay, so we're talking about security, but before we get onto that, last week we spoke about uh, the infrastructure behind e-learning. That's one of the questions, yeah, people asked. Yes, and you said you would come back to us with a checklist, and you have not disappointed. Thank you. So we're going to look at it now. It's up on screen. Okay. Um, and it's beautifully set out. Thank you. Um, Gus did it, so thanks for that <laughs> at the office. I think one of the things that we found is in terms of it being a checklist, it's pretty difficult because everybody's situation is different. And if you have a pure checklist, you could quite easily exclude yourself and say, whoops, I can't do this because I don't meet criteria one and two. So what we've tried to do is we've tried to consider three options, whether you're working on a very limited budget or a modest or limited budget and then an unlimited budget. And we've divided into three sections, what hardware you could afford and what software you can use and what your internet connectivity is. And I think schools will be able to get a good sense just based upon that where they find themselves. And then as you scroll down, we've taken each of those components. We've looked very carefully at the specs or specifications that they should be considering. And then particularly, I think, as important as the column, what to use it for. It's all okay. very well to say, oh, you need to go off and get a 3G router type thing, but w what are you going to use it for? Or if you're going to get a tablet, why would you use a tablet versus using a desktop or a laptop? Sure. So, so it's, e uh, it's ICTs for dummies almost. What, how, what do I choose and then how do I use it? That's it, yeah. What to use it for. And the webinar is about how you use these things. Yes. Oh, that's fantastic. It's quite long. So it's, it's very worth long. going through. It's very, I think it's well worth going through. People can find it on our website. They yes. go and have a look. And we've provided a version where they'll be able to print it so that it doesn't try and squeeze all these pages into one tiny little PDF. Yes, and then you can't read it at all. That's it, yeah. So they can find the printable version or they can scroll online like we are. Okay. Well, I'll let people go through that in their own time. We're not going to read through each point. So yep. let's go on to what's up for today. Mm -hmm. And here it is. Is there really a threat? Now this is in terms of security. That's it. Taking care of learners, taking care of hardware and software, and taking care of data. That's okay. the agenda. Yes, it is. But we're not going to start talking, are we? No, I think when we were chatting, I thought a really good idea would be for us to go into a sense of of what is this threat and is there a threat and you found us a really good video that I think will give people a good sense of where we're going in today's talk. And this video as well as all of the other videos that we do show on the webinar are available on YouTube That's so it. you will be able to find them there and uh, let's go to it. 
Uh, I think this one was developed. Okay, I'll let it play. Once you post your image online, you can't take it back. Anyone can see it. Family, friends, anyone. Remember, think before you post. That video was created as a public service announcement, I think somewhere in the States, and I can't find the original copy. but. I think it really brings across the point of how a simple posting can become so much more. That's it. And I think, you know, we're so comfortable, well, particularly young people are so comfortable online. We very quickly forget that in that safe space that we're working, it may not be as safe as we think. Yes. And whereas previously, you know, you wrote a letter to somebody, it could be crumpled up and destroyed. Whereas now, it once it's posted, it's posted online forever. And yes. once you've worked there, it's going to be there for a long time. And it's not just pictures that can be redistributed. It can be political views that you have or, uh, okay, so hopefully this never happens to learners because they wouldn't be drinking, but some kind of drunken message that they typed and then it's just reposted or retweeted over and over. That's it. Uh, for example, that American woman who was coming to South Africa and then tweeted that it's some terrible tweet. By the time she landed in South Africa, she'd lost her job and... That's the end of it. Yeah, yeah, she wasn't greeted with happy faces at the no. airport. But I think one of the key things is that whenever we see these sort of public service announcements, there's a lot about, I mean, it seems always to be what's happening in America, what's happening in, in Europe. And I found some interesting statistics about South Africa that I think might make this seem a little more real. Well, let's go on to them. Just click next. And there we go. I mean, this is from January 2014, so things have only <coughs> increased. And population of about 48.6 million, and we got 20 million internet users, which is 41%. Now, when I saw that, I was quite startled because I kept thinking, oh, but we don't have broadband. Yes. But we forget that if you look at the bottom, there are 68.4 million cell sure. phone users and more and more cell phones have the ability to be online. So it makes that 20 million very, very easy. So in terms of averages, I mean, if you factor children into that 48.6 million and assuming that young children wouldn't have cell phones, it means that every adult could very easily have two phones and be working on both. That's it. But more and more young people do have cell phones. And I think the whole policy where, where people have a contract and you're able to keep your handsets and get a new handset and upgrade every two years means that more and more cell phones are actually trickling down to younger and younger people. Yes. Oh, yes. So, and I mean, just in terms of what we're talking about, Facebook, 9.8 million South Africans on Facebook actively. Okay, so that's 20%. Yeah. So the use of social media is with us and it's growing. So... What we're talking about today, a lot of the statistics, we're going to have to be using overseas statistics because they're more easily available and we haven't started making those statistical analyses for us. But I think as we look at them, people need to bear these figures in mind because I think they come back to talk to us. Yes. Well, let's take a look at those statistics you're talking about. Okay. And I did get a fright when I looked at these because I thought, I have a six-year-old and she's not on the internet. Okay, there have been a few times where I've Googled something with her. But other than that, she's not on it. Okay. So where are these statistics from? These are British statistics. And again, another public service announcement being put out. And I mean, five to age five to seven, 82% of kids online, probably not nearly anything like that in South Africa. But when you're looking at the age 12 to 15, almost every single child in the UK online. And I think we're going to move there. Yes. Sooner than we think. And 
the curious thing is, is that in terms of the government wanting to make available that um, ICT infrastructure for schools, it means that automatically every single one of our 12 million odd learners is going to be online. Yes. So we'll have 100% technically between age 6 and age 18. I wonder how many discussions they have about what they're doing online and discussions with younger people and discussions with older I wonder if it is a point of discussion or do you only discuss things that you're doing online with people that you're online with but I think we come to that later anyway we do talk anyway. about that yeah. yes. um, we're going to be talking a bit, little later about the consequences of this but 28% of children between 11 and 16 have um, experienced something upsetting in the last year on social networks and you know, we always want to keep children safe and yeah. happy, but a third of them are being made unhappy by the very thing that's supposed to create connected, connectedness yes. and well-being. More scary, perhaps, um, for you as a mother of a child, that one in three of the people who are online haven't actually met, which means that they're talking to complete strangers on screens rather than human beings that they know. So, sure. you know, We talk about um, stranger danger and don't yes. talk to strangers, and yet when it seems to be a photograph of somebody your age, etc., you're going to go on time. Oh, yes. We've chatted a lot about time and whether or not there should be that much screen time for young people. And, I mean, looking at age three to seven, six and a half hours... A week online, let alone watching television, I think is scary. So it's almost an hour a day. That's it. Yeah. And then just the last one I want to talk about now is just looking at the number of kids who own a digital device, which could either be a phone or a tablet or a computer. And the number of items there are significant. Pleased to see that it's only, only 41% at age three and four, <laughs> but... 95% by 12 to 15. I see some of my friends doing this, though. They have a toddler, and suddenly the toddler has an iPad. I don't have an iPad. Why does a two-, three-year-old need an iPad? I don't know, but... Um, yeah. I, think yeah. there, I think there's some really fabulous things that a three-year-old could be doing on an iPad. I'm not sure if they need their own personal iPad in which to do it. Yes, that's yeah. more the point. For me, yeah. No, I, I want an iPad. Just, if someone buys me one, I'll be very happy. Okay. And this statistic over here, 41% of parents believe their children know more about internet than they do. Uh, that's, that's very curious, that one. You know, the majority of teachers are parents in our country. Now, that statistic for the UK, 41% believe the kids know more than they do, I would say is pretty fair to say it's representative in South Africa. Mm. Now, as teachers, we're there to guide and lead our learners and if there's a perception that the learners know more about it, one of two things can happen. Either you can refuse to use it because you don't want to be shown up, or you can give the reins over to them and be led by them, and they may well not be able to lead as securely and safely as we want to do. So I think it's something we need to keep in the back of our minds as we talk throughout yes. the rest of the afternoon. Yes, I think so. Okay, moving on to more statistics... Do you know what your children are doing online? Okay, well, 75% of parents don't monitor their children's online activity each day. Now, when I came across these statistics, I thought, oh, well, goodness gracious, do you expect me as a parent to, on, to manage my children's online activity every single day? But when we start talking about the things that we are, you start to think, well, surely, you know, you ask, how was your day? Did you do your homework? Yes. Why aren't you asking what were you doing online? What did yes. you do? What did you learn? What did you see? And I think also monitoring your children's online activity doesn't necessarily mean that you have to ask them questions. It could just mean that they only use the computer in a public area where you can constantly walk past and monitor it without asking questions. That's it. Looks a bit better when we go weekly. 64% of parents under 35 are checking weekly and 40% of parents over 45. <coughs> now, what struck me there automatically is that it seems that younger parents are more in tune with some of the dangers perhaps or more in tune with the technology. Now, bringing that back to South Africa, 
the majority of our teachers are over 45, which puts them into that <coughs> parental age group. So one wonders how teachers are feeling in terms of monitoring their learners, where they have online learners in their classrooms, how they feel about it and what they're doing in terms of the monitoring. Yeah. And then 15% never check. And that's it. Which means that at least 15% of children are at risk if they haven't been well educated in terms of what they should do when they're working on social media, when they're going online. I can hear some of my friends' voices in my head saying, but yeah, my child, I should trust them and um, they must do what's right and I must just believe that they're going to do that. Without uh, getting into any moral sort of things, mm. I think, yes, we need to trust our children, but we're not necessarily able to trust everybody out there. Yes. And in South Africa, as I said, we've got another 19,998,000 whatever thousand people yes. out there. I mean, and that just excludes the... That's only if they manage to be stuck in the South African um, online. But yes. actually, it's international, and there's billions of people online. Well, you know, if these parents were sending their 15-year-old to a birthday party, they would want to know whose house it is at, who else is going to be attending. So the same rules should apply. That's it. Yes. This graphic was quite interesting for me, particularly not just the fact that 48% of parents believe their teens tell them everything they do online. It goes back to those 15-year-olds <laughs> at parties you were just talking about. Ooh. All that 71% of teens have hidden their online behavior from their parents. But the fact, actually, that it's infographic produced by McAfee, a well-known antivirus supplier. Yes. And there's a lot of people doing a lot of things to make sure that everybody's safe online. And I think before we make people out there start thinking oh heavens we better turn off the webinar before we get infected by some sort of <laughs> evil that's going to come off the internet we need to say that actually it's not all doom and gloom and not all bad yes and i think we need to look at it in a more holistic way and okay. that's what i hope we can do i agree with you there you can't just uh, say no to everything because one thing scares you that's it Okay, so the next point we're going to talk about is a hugely loaded issue, and that is cyberbullying. Okay. It's, what is... What is cyberbullying? Yes. Well, in the basic definition, it's bullying via electronic means. You know, when we were growing up and we didn't have cell phones and tablets, etc., the bullies used to grab you and beat you at the gate, or they used to demand lunch money or lunch from you. Yes. Or they used to tease you or make fun of you. And those were all very in-your-face activities. The problem now is that with connectivity, it's possible that those same bullies are able to do the same thing, except they can do it using their cell phones. They can use it, use their tablets, computers. They use the communication methods, email, Facebook, etc. And so what starts to happen is you get the same physical bullying taking place except in electronic form. And perhaps that might be an even more dangerous way because it's not as public as one would see a normal bully physically bullying somebody. Or maybe not as obvious because technically it's in the public domain. In the public domain. But when I'm reading the horrible email you sent me on my phone, unless I show something true. else, it's, 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 it's my anxiety that I've got to carry as a, as, a, as a child. In fact, as an adult, I mean, I think we need to be aware that cyberbullying happens uh, for adults as well. People yes. are stalked. People do get abusive messages. And so, yeah, becoming aware of cyberbullying is quite a key issue. Now, yes. Uh, just a quick point to, to add in there. The, one of the other differences that I've heard between sort of physical, traditional bullying and, and cyberbullying is, is often the step into that bullying behavior is a lot more difficult to make if you have to physically be present and you have to physically see the person that you're bullying. It's a lot easier. It's a lot more conscionable for you to bully somebody through technology um, rather than, than physically. So a lot more people can, can more easily do it. That's it. I mean, Helena, you were talking about keyboard... Keyboard courage. Keyboard courage. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And I think keyboard courage is an absolutely amazing concept because it's very easy to hide behind a screen and tap on a keyboard and send out these messages. But as Dylan says, to go face-to-face -face with somebody can be a completely different thing. Yeah. 
And these are children That's at the it. end of the day. And if it's happening, I mean, it would be nothing for me to get a horrible email and to then pick up the phone and confront the person and say, listen, what's going on? Why are you doing this? Or I say it would be nothing, but let's see when it actually happens. But it's a lot more difficult if you're eight or nine That's and it. you've received some kind of threatening SMS and you feel isolated and alone. That's it's it. not nice. No. No. And it's more prevalent than we think. Yes, which is the next question. How prevalent is it? Okay. Well, I mean, we were in the previous slides, we've spoken about 28% of um, children have experienced some sort of upsetting thing during social media. And the statistics that I found are that 16% in a survey last year done in the United Kingdom, 16% of children had experienced cyberbullying in some form or other. And that's... Seems small, but sixteen percent is a, a good chunk of the of the young people who are online. Yes, and what we forget is with a statistic like that, it's okay. It's sixteen out of a hundred, so yeah. But they also have friends, and that cyberbullying does affect the friends because who will a child turn to? Or I know it from a girl's point of view, age eleven, something like that happened. I would have told all of my friends. I'm sure then it turns into a vicious cycle because bullying and then you fight back with your friends and oh, that's it messy messy very much indeed but of course if 16 percent of learners say that they've bullied been bullied online one has to ask the question is who's doing the bullying and in the same survey nine percent of learners admitted to engaging in cyber bullying now the survey that was done was an anonymous survey so hopefully all the bullies spoke out. But that 10% of, of kids had engaged in it means that it's quite an easy thing to do. One in yes. 10 children. I mean, we're sitting in a class, got 38 or 40 children. That means four of those children are committing cyberbullying. Yes. I wonder if they even know that that's what they're doing. Well, I think that's, that's quite a key question because, mm. you know, it's very easy to, to call you a name to your face. But if I send something as, as apparently as um, insubstantial as an email. You know, it's just a few little keystrokes and then off it goes. D do they know that that is cyberbullying? Yes. That's one question. And also, I mean, sometimes just sending a friend request on Facebook, for example, and the person ignores you and sending again and again and again and again, that turns into a form of bullying. Yeah, and like intimidation type very thing. Very much so, and it's hard to <coughs> quantify that. So yes. I think it's possible that some cyber bullies don't really know that it is that they what they're doing. But I mean, one starts to think. Well, ultimately, if it's if you can think of it as a physical act rather than just an online act, and they're the same, well, then ultimately, you yes. should know what you're doing. I think when you're talking about it with children, if someone has posted an unfair comment or something like that, maybe asking them, would you write that on a piece of paper and stick it on the person physically? That's it. Would you be able to walk up to them, look them in the eyes and do that? That's it. Yeah. I mean, yeah. There's a couple of lovely questions I came across around that. And children should be taught when they're posting. Would A, would they say it publicly in, yes. in a public forum? B, is that something they want to be remembered yes. for? Yes. And if, if, if they just keep those two questions in mind, I think it could help a whole lot. I think also we talk a lot about cyberbullying as if someone's already on a social network. But another form is taking photos of someone and then posting them wherever, whether it's sending it off on SMS or it's um, posting it on a public forum. That's it. It's still cyberbullying because it. it's using technology. And, I mean, we've seen that quite a bit in South Africa. We've had those horrible videos either of children um, engaging in sexual practices or even children fighting that suddenly yes. go viral because it gets sent from one cell phone to another. So the, the original participants weren't involved, but suddenly everything about them is public, yeah? Yes, Horrible, horrible, horrible. Okay, now the next step then, seeing as we've started talking about the sexual aspect, which is usually a taboo topic in the studio, <laughs> <laughs> we need to talk about taking care of learners in terms of exposure to adults, unwanted adult attention. Right. 
I think we were being quite strategic when we put this order of things together today because usually we would start here because I think the the fear of adult predators mm. and children is the first thing that comes to mind when people think about the security of learners. And I think our wanting to foreground that learners themselves are engaging in this sort of negative behavior was quite important. But it doesn't mean that there are adults who would want to find out things about learners, become involved with learners in ways that we do not want them to be. Yes. And it's something that we can only train young people to be aware of just as we train them don't talk to a stranger we need to start inculcating the same levels in terms of what do you do when I'm online etc it's almost the same set of rules that would apply in everyday life that that's it you'd apply online that's it and it's, it's common sense rules and I'm not exactly sure why Online has made us lose some of our common sense. Yes. But it seems to be. So, yeah, so some very basic rules, uh, I think. Number one is to set up some ground rules. Well, there we go. <laughs> That's it. You know, what, what are the, what, when may you use your device? Where may you go online? What sort of things? And it's not about just setting those rules, but it's about negotiating the terms of those rules with the children yes. so that they get to understand exactly what it's about. That it's not just, as children so often want to believe, oh, mom and dad are being spiteful to me, you know, yes. they want to get me. They don't want me to have friends. But it's about discussing that in ways that make sense to them at the time. It's almost like teaching them how to navigate the pantry. You're not going to, you say, listen, that bottom shelf is mommy and daddy's only because that's where the alcohol is. Okay, maybe it's the top, top shelf. shelf. <laughs> I was just wondering about the structure of your... <laughs> that's not a, <laughs> not a good example. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Please refer to rule four on the slide, <laughs> Helen. <laughs> and then the sweets, that's for occasional use but only over under supervision. Uh, but there's a fruit bowl over there that you're welcome to. If you're going to use the eggs, make sure that you cook them first. It's a set of procedures. That's it. Everything's available, but you can't have everything. That's right. Yeah, because so much can be. But in terms of, of that availability, what it is possible to do is to set parental control on mm. devices. Now, Apple devices are quite easy because they have built-in parental controls that you can set. Android devices are a little more complex because you have to download software. Okay. But there is a number of places that are offering free software that parents are able to set that control. So it prevents the child being able to go to certain websites. It prevents social media, etc., mm. etc. So Some of the software of even tracks their movements, what they spend more time doing. So you can choose what you want That's it. in your software. Yes, Dylan. Can we get some suggested examples of those, perhaps for the blog post? That's a fantastic idea. I mean, one of the most popular ones is K9, I mean, mm. as in K9, and that's very, very effective in terms of it. But yeah, we'll let's add some in. I think yeah, good places to go. And this kind of list is always evolving because technology, there's always something bigger and better coming out. So maybe if someone out there has one that they use, send it through. That's it. Let yeah. Dylan know; he'll make a list. Mm, thank yes. you, Dylan. <laughs> <laughs> Number three says, educate yourself and your children about the internet and safety. That's it. I mean, going back to earlier, where that number of parents believe their children know more about the internet than they do, we're adults. We can learn quickly and effectively, and I think yes. we need to put ourselves in that position. I, mean, in the, I think it was the second webinar of the first we spoke about the difference between a digital native and a digital immigrant. And... Yes, we may as adults all be the digital immigrants, but we can actually become a little more naturalized to the world that we're working in now. Yes. Yes. Uh, and then the fourth one says, set a good example. So don't put the alcohol on the bottom shelf. Possibly not. But I think it's also, I mean, for me there it's quite tricky because obviously your children wouldn't always be exposed to whatever it is that you're doing online. But the point is here, good examples are screen time. Yes. Um, the use of devices at dinner tables and, and things like that. And for, for, for children to start to see that the technology has a place in the world and it's a very powerful place, but it doesn't have to dominate everything. Mm. And I think that's where parents have the opportunity to set a really good example. Uh, yes, Dylan. Sorry, just a quick question on that point, and perhaps just to extend it as well. Um, 
question three on on the on the IRC feed is is what should schools be doing if they become aware of this kind of predatory behaviour or even cyberbullying, and what kind of example should schools be it, it's be setting in this in this area? It's it's easier to imagine a parent setting an example. Yes. Bring that to the school context, Matt. Okay. Well, that's actually the next slide. <laughs> so I wonder if you could <laughs> hang in there with us and we'll be able to do it. Well, yes, it is. <laughs> what schools can do. Education, not prohibition. Okay, I think that's a key one for me. The internet and social media provide a remarkable possibility for learning. And we need to not fall into the trap that it's easier just to say no you can't have anything and rather look towards the education of it yes there are enough places online that you can go to to get good safe material and we need to be helping learners get to those places we need to be setting up the understanding of our learners in such ways that they understand why some places are, are good and some places are not so good when it comes to the internet and internet usage. So Dylan, I think to answer the question that you raised, I think in many ways schools take on much the same role as the parent and need to play that role because with connectivity coming to schools, there's going to be the possibility of all of these things happening. And I'd hate to see a situation that we've got a broadband connection to every school in South Africa and the children never go online because yes. everybody's just too scared f to use it. So we need to duplicate it. I mean, and I th the second point we make is that they need to set up standard operating procedures for internet security. Now, every school has a set of procedures for general safety and general security that the teachers and the, and the learners comply with. And I think it's very much a similar situation. We just need to develop those sorts of rules so that when it comes to the internet, that they duplicate back to the common sense, yes. everyday thing you spoke about earlier. I'd like to talk more about the education, not prohibition, because mm. this is something that affects us quite a bit in our working circumstance. We've got a lot of educational content on YouTube, like Khan Academy and things like that. But what we often find is that educational institutions block YouTube out of fear of seeing something that's inappropriate. If people actually put a little bit more thought and effort into finding out about YouTube, they'd see that YouTube doesn't really allow inappropriate content on the platform. They've got quite a strict measuring guideline. Uh, yes, some things do slip through, but they're quite difficult to find and there are also ways to get around that if you block YouTube or you block Facebook or you block whatever you're blocking a method to learn mm -hmm. and sometimes the learning is not only about the content that's present present there it's also about learning how to manage yourself on that platform one of the, a great skill you need to learn when managing YouTube or going onto YouTube is to not get distracted by cat videos <laughs> <laughs> and that's really important it's a really good 21st century skill to learn that's it I mean it's that discernment and you're not going to learn the discernment unless you have the opportunity to, to play with it but I mean two things one you could as a school what you can do is you can set the YouTube use to safe Yes, and that is a possibility but secondly also if the school registers for a Google education account it automatically is going to put place higher filter levels on the YouTube, which is part of Google, so that they don't learners don't easily have access to anything that might slip through because what's once it's in that yes. container, as it were, it's been very, very carefully vetted. Now, going back to the question about uh, what do you do as a school, I'm reminded of when I was studying and we did this um, education course within the education course we were already doing. And we spoke about in loco parentis, mm -hmm. where school becomes the parents while the child is at school. So all of the rights that apply to parents, and, okay, I'm not a law person, but the, how I understood it is basically as soon as someone steps into my classroom, I am their parent until they leave again. So the same things I apply at home to my children, I would apply in my classroom. If it's not acceptable for my children to behave unacceptably uh, on the internet, then it won't be acceptable within my classroom as well. 
It is very difficult to manage, though, when you've got private messages flying around. And I do remember one case where this did happen, where there was a child who was being stalked by another child in the school, and it was horrible. Eventually there were death threats issued, and this child didn't know who this other person was. How do you deal with that? Well, luckily the child had enough support that they could find figure out who it was, and that person went through a proper disciplinary process and was dealt with um, and you have to if you're being threatened whether it be a threat over an email or a threat in real life it has to be dealt with that's it. so it comes down to that standard operating procedures for the internet and security that's it and I think making it a discussion document in the first instance I think is quite key because again otherwise it turns into that sort of particularly for teenagers that sort of rebellious thing, ha, you don't want me to go there, so let me see if I can sneak in whilst the teacher's not looking and go to those sites. Uh, it needs to be that sort of negotiation so that there's a greater understanding of, of what the dangers are. Yes. You almost have to do a bit of psychological maneuvering here where you have to guide them into doing what you want them to do rather than rebelling against what you want them to do. Yes, And I've seen some nice things online in terms of pledges that children can sign, say things like, do no harm to others and stuff like that. Uh, Would you like to take a look at it? Yeah, let's have a look at one. Would you mind pressing escape on the keyboard? I can do that. And then we can go to... And this is just the first thing that popped up on Google, and it has a whole lot of printable pledges that they can download. But what you see is it says, I will not... I will tell my trusted adult if anything makes me feel sad, scared, or confused. And that's a really great phrasing for a young child. It's obviously a primary school. That's it. And it's important to have rules like that so that people feel open to talk about what's happening. I think it's good. What I like particularly about this site is that they've got a set of rules for internet safety rules and then they got real world safety rules and if you look at them the real world safety rules mirror very much the internet safety rules which is exactly what we're talking about earlier yes okay but back to our presentation and the topic at hand which is security okay and we're going to move on to taking care of hardware and software that's it. I mean, I think what we're moving towards here is the sort of, oh, oh, I nearly said the more adult part of the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> and I think the reason I think of that is just that I always think of, of it's the, the adult's responsibility to take care of the technology. Thank you, Devin. Yes, so um, although the person who's using the technology would be the first to pick up that something is not right. That's it. But yes. remember, both teacher and learner should be using the technology. Yes. So the first one says, well, what is a virus? Okay, well, viruses, I mean, everybody seems to know what a virus is when they get it and they wonder about how they got it afterwards. It's really just any piece of software, coding, text that duplicates itself on a machine and is able to take over portions or even a whole computer and do all sorts of damage. So viruses are created with very negative intent and they cause a great deal of harm. I mean, and the number of viruses that get generated yearly are runs into the hundreds of thousands. If you visit one of the antivirus software sites like Kaspersky or McAfee, you'll be horrified to see exactly how many viruses get set out into the wild every single day. Yeah. I read somewhere a long time ago, and I should have re-googled it to find out, but I heard that there's quite a big industry in creating viruses. People make a lot of money. Apparently so. It's scary. It is. I would think the way you would make money is by then selling the antivirus solution to an antivirus software company. That's it. So you create a problem and then you fix it. Well, you don't want to get into conspiracy theories. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I mean, many schools have found that, for example, going for Apple products where there seem to be fewer viruses are a better solution just because they don't, they, there are fewer threats. Yes. But, I mean, not every school wants to go that route because automatically it moves them into a different space in terms of the software that's available, for example. Yes. But it's something to be aware of. But... Antiviral software is really easily available. There is 
really great free stuff available. And when you think of the damage that can get done, spending some money on it is certainly the way to go. That old proverb, penny wise, pound foolish, is pretty much <laughs> what kicks into there. Now, what is the difference between getting a virus and being hacked? Okay, hacking is a way of exposing information and getting information so okay. that you're able to find out things. Now, that falls into the spyware category that we got okay. on the screen so that basically people are able to get into your machine and find out information. The latest big one has been Apple's cloud being hacked and all the celebrity photographs being exposed to the public. Yeah, I think um, that's our horrible. banks have some of our banks have been hacked a few times and personal information has been made public. So that's getting information out of it. Okay. I thought malware was the same as spyware. Well, malware is, again, it's, it's a more of a global sort of thing. It's, it's any software, and that's where mal, bad, software, soft, um, apart from software, it's any software that has bad intent, and it um, doesn't replicate, which makes it different from a virus, okay. but it'll sit on your computer and it will do a variety of things. So some of it will create extra links, it'll turn when you're searching on the internet for example all of a sudden you'll find as you move your mouse over your cursor over a word suddenly an advertisement will pop up and to get rid of that malware it takes a lot of effort yes but all antiviral software takes care of it yes i know i struggled with malware a while ago and managed to find another free download which sorted it out for me on top of the antivirus software i had as well that's it yes i didn't actually know that there was a difference up until then. Okay. Okay. Then, of course, there's antivirus software. Which we've spoken about. And without selling any any particular product, all you have to do is Google that and thousands of possibilities yes. will come up. And there's some really good companies that give it away for free. Because yes. ultimately they do want people to be able to use the internet safely because it becomes an important way of them being able to sell other products. Yes, exactly. So it's not a bad thing at all. So it's in their best interest to keep the flow of information coming to and from your computer That's safely. A, definitely. Yeah, and if they create a good impression by making you feel safe, then obviously you're going to spend more money with them in other areas. That's right. Yes, back to conspiracies. <laughs> <laughs> and then the last point, safe downloads. Okay. Safe downloads is, is, is just something that we got to really pay attention to. You know, every now and again you think, gee, it would be so wonderful if I had some sort of software that would allow me to mark exams more quickly. And you can Google it, and I can almost guarantee you're going to find some or other software that would be able to meet those needs. Now, good software places are few comparison to the number of places that have a little bit of malware or a bit of virus <coughs> hidden within the software so they sort of send it out to you so you go off to the downloads you download something that's got hidden little friends yes. that are going to damage your system so you need to go to to um, places to download the download software that are well known that have a good reputation and you know every time you find one place and want to download something if you just google that and see what the reputation for that company yes. is and you'll be able to quickly find out whoops there's a problem over here and read the reviews read the reviews yes mm. i mean that's the joy about the internet is it keeps reporting on itself yes so there's there shouldn't be surprises i don't think i have come across quite a few uh, websites where you want to download a certain piece of software from that have been direct copies of the original website and, and the way you can tell it's a copy is not by looking at the website, but by looking at that address bar at the top. And yes. you'll see that the URL is not exactly how it's meant to be. That's Maybe it. it's got an extra S somewhere. or That's right. Yeah. So pay attention to, or, to where you it. are. Yeah. I mean, I think often what we do online is we just sort of look at the page. We don't look at, the, at that top bar. And I think it's critical. And when we're talking about phishing in a minute... We, I want to talk about that because it's quite an important way of being able to solve the phishing problem. Well, let's go to that. Okay, that's those famous emails you get that tell you that you've just received from your bank a certain amount of money and all you need to do is log in, yes. click below, and put in your banking details so that the transfer can happen. Now, if you click on that link, it opens up a apparent 
web page that is your bank's. But if you look back right at the top, you're going to find all sorts of curious www and then a whole lot of stuff before it gets to your bank name. Yes. If your bank name is even mentioned anywhere in in the, in the address bar, so it's one way of actually being aware of what's happening. That it was a phishing scam. Now, uh, phishing is. Um, a bizarre term, I suppose, for most people, and they wonder why. But it comes from the notion of when you go fishing and you put in lots of bait. Now, electronic um, communication allows you to send out 10 million emails yes. at one time. Now, if you send 10 million emails to people and ask them to put in their banking details and only 1%, you're the maths person. <laughs> Okay, hundred thousand. A hundred thousand bank accounts you've got access to. I hope so, I got that right. Is it? <laughs> I'm sure somebody will tweet in a moment if yes. you got it wrong. Okay. So yeah, the phishing attacks are very much about getting your personal information, your passwords, your bank account details, and I mean, really, it's about knowing how your bank would or any yes. other communi- people would communicate with you. SARS never asks you to put in information. Your bank hardly ever asks you, if ever, to put in information other than when you uh, have logged into the internet all yes. by yourself. So following a link in an email is just really asking for trouble. So the email itself isn't dangerous. It's following, clicking on that link and following it. Well, that's it, yeah. It's yes. just a way of, of giving you a bit of bait on a hook. Yes. Whether you can take the bait or not is what it's about I have a wonderful mother-in-law uh, who is <laughs> <laughs> I'm very lucky she's not watching now is she no but no. I'll show her this and then okay. I'll, I'll tell her what I want for Christmas but that she, iPad <laughs> yes <laughs> uh, she is 75 and she's very good on the computer with emails everything she's not a typical 75 year old but she will occasionally phone and say listen I've just got this email do I trust it? It says that I need to re-enter details and things like that. And I think that's a really important lesson. If you're not quite sure, phone someone, ask someone else, just get a second opinion. If you have a gut feel that something isn't quite right, you're probably right. Something probably isn't quite right. And just follow that. That's it's okay. It. The, the bank's not going to lose all of your money if you don't click on the link. If a stranger walked up to you and said, may I please have your bank account details? Yes. You would say, no. <laughs> so why would a piece of electronic communication suddenly make you want to do it? Yes. Yes. That's it. Oh, it goes back to the whole thing. If I, if I found it on Google, it must be true. Mm-hmm. It's No, it, there's just as much rubbish in the Internet as there is in real life. That's it. And yes. healthy skepticism, I think, is always good. Yes, Very definitely. Now, passwords. I must admit, I'm not very good at password management. I don't think very many people are good at password management. I know every month when I get an email from an administrator to tell me to change my password, it drives me to distraction. (laughs) (laughs) Because I hardly manage to remember it from day to day. Let alone having to remember 12 different ones. And we always have these rules that you may not use one that you've used in the last 24 months that may not have all these sorts of things. Yes. And so we become lazy. And... I think we go back to the idea of the phishing where you can send out 10 million emails with a click of a button. It's as easy for anybody to hack into your account by just setting a computer to keep running through every possible combination. And probably the first combination that's going to try is Q-W-E-R-T-Y or 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 or P-A-S-S-W-O-R-D. If those three fail, they'll move on to the next X number. But yes. because it's all happening electronically and it, with such amazing speed, eventually, given time, they will be able to hack into your password. And using personal information in a password is very easy to – makes it very easy for these machines to find your password. <coughs> well, that's it. So, so the goal here really is, is that you should be changing your password regularly. I'm not sure every month, but uh, – terms of your banking etc probably every two to three months so that the time that you've given anybody to do the hacking is stopped and they've got to start yes. the process again which is not to suggest that there are thousands of people out there waiting to hack into your personal bank account at this very moment but given the possibilities so and then to make the password as strong as possible mm. and there are a few techniques that you can use to do that so what is a strong password? Okay, a strong password in the first instance should have eight characters in it or more. Okay. 
up to 16 or 20, depending on whatever. But I find trying to remember eight is usually <laughs> an ideal sort of number. Okay. So, so the first one is so that we're going to have eight. Then we're going to have to make sure that you have uppercase letters and lowercase letters. So we're going to have A, Bs, and we're going to have Cs uh, and Ds. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> to include some numbers. And you include special characters. And by special characters, we're talking about the ats, okay. etc. Hashtags. Now, and hashtags and all those sorts of things. Now, what I found quite easy is if you start to think of it, because it's hard to remember these ones, and of course, it doesn't really help if you write it down somewhere or type it into your computer. You're not going to be able to access it. So it's quite important that you come up with a way that you can remember it and creating words or sentences is a useful way to do it. So something okay. that I came across is this lovely sentence, I like starfish. So, okay. Okay. So if we're going to play with it, we want to do certain things. So what you could do is all the I's you could replace with a numeral one. Okay. Okay. So we've got there we can put in a capital letter. So we've got an uppercase letter. Okay. There's a lowercase ke. A star automatically makes me think of the character um, asterisk. And then you'll notice that I've left out the I in fish. Because the idea here is that what we're wanting to do is create words that aren't in the dictionary. Because a word that's in the dictionary is something that's going to be more easily looked at in terms of when you're hacking into a password. So now we have a password. Now we could account. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine letters. And I like starfish as a sentence or something that you're probably going to remember quite easily. Yes. And when you'd have to type it in to go one capital L, one K, E, asterisk, F, S, H, is not impossible. Yes. So that's quite a useful technique. But ideally what you don't want to do is you don't want your Amazon account and your Google account and your bank account all to have the same oh, password. <laughs> not saying I'm guilty of that. I am. But <laughs> so yes. the way you, something you can do then is if you give each of those a number or a letter, for example, so you have a bank account and you've got your Amazon account and you've got your Google account. That's very clever. So then you add that onto that password that we've used there. So we've now moved to 11 characters in the password. And I know that it's bank, I like starfish, or yes. Amazon, I like starfish, or Google, I like starfish. So it's becoming more and more tricky. Okay, so now we can't all change our <laughs> password to <laughs> I like starfish. starfish. <laughs> well, it could make <laughs> life a whole lot easier. <laughs> Yes, it could. Okay. Now, I spoke, <laughs> I spoke about the fact that we also want it to be time away, mm. and ideally maybe every three months. So if you start, if you did your first password in 0114, you would know in, when, it, when the month turned to 0414 that you needed to change your password. Oh, ah. That is very clever. So yeah, so I mean, it's a it's a very it's a very simple little technique, but it's just we lazy to make passwords work properly. And with a good password, we can protect all our data, we can protect all our information, we can protect our safety. Yes. And if we start developing good strong passwords, I think that's going to be a whole lot easier. And it's a nice quick technique. Yes, Dylan. So, some other advice I heard once is is to say that not all your accounts are created equal that there are certain accounts, like obviously your bank, that you really want a good, strong password for. But then there are probably hundreds, maybe not hundreds, dozens of other accounts to smaller services that you know, it really doesn't matter if it did get hacked into. Mm -hmm. You're not putting anything That's it. really personal there. There you can let your memory kind of take a break a little and just rather concentrate on those key services in your life that you need good, strong passwords for. Very much so. Yes. Yeah. Yes, and it's not only your safety you're protecting when you have a good password. It's all the safety of the people who are connected to that account. So let's say it's your Facebook account, which feels like something it shouldn't need. It feels like it should be a lesser account. But if you've got private messages uh, from someone and you want to protect them, then you should have a good password. That's it. Yes. 
Okay, so we're not going to end off on a negative note. No, I think it's quite important. We've done a lot of negative talking in terms of the bad things out there, but I think there's a lot of good things out in the world as well. And I think we should be aware that there are a lot of people working towards things being safe and secure on the internet. Yes. Because if we get into the mindset that it's going to be bad, we're going to want to prohibit, especially learners at schools, because schools do have a social responsibility to the kids. So we thought to set teachers' minds at rest, to know that there are people out there who are also concerned. You came across this really brilliant video that I think shows the realities that exist and the possibilities that we can have a better, safer internet. Yes. So I'm going to press play as soon as Dylan pulls it up on screen. It's good music too. When you try your best but you don't succeed When you get what you want but not what you need When you feel so tired but you can't sleep Stuck in Come streaming down your face When you lose something you can't replace When you love someone but it goes to waste Could it be That's very sweet. And powerful, because I think ultimately it's about taking personal responsibility. Yes. And having courage as well, away from keyboard courage to more towards face-to-face communication courage. And then what I like about it is that it speaks to being a whole person and interacting as that whole person, whether you're interacting on the keyboard or in person. That's it. Okay, so I think I've just said your, sp- your point. Over again, (laughs) (laughs) different words. We've got an exciting show for next week. That's it. We're going to be looking at some e-learning lessons. Yes. Sort of little micro lessons and playing with TPAC. So people can get a final reminder of what TPAC is, which I think will also set people off into how to create good e-learning and in fact good learning lessons. You gave me a preview of some of the things we'll be talking about next week, and I am so excited. It made me feel really, really great, emotional about what's happening in those classrooms. So the, I'm really looking forward to it. You must join us next week at 3 o'clock. Uh, are there any 
final points you no, would like to say? Just has been really fun today and good serious stuff that we had to deal with, but uh, I hope everybody enjoyed it and learned something. Yes, I hope so too. And this is a big topic. There's no way we could have spoken about everything in an hour. No. But go and try and find resources online. Google. That's it. And yes. then check the reviews. Yes, check the reviews. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dylan, for the behind-the-scenes magic. Thank and you, Dylan. We'll see you again next week. Cheerio. Bye.